interest purposes. Yeah. And if you are such a corporate entity, mm -hmm. the fact that you are not pursuing your objectives for commercial purposes does not mean that the scrutiny with which society will subject a commercially oriented organization, you can be um, given yeah. the green card. They will say that, oh, you are, you are not, not for profit, so you can be, can be allowed the, the, the executive director or secretary can decide to pay himself huge fat of uh, maybe salary or use <coughs> resources to the organization for personal purposes. Yeah. So I think those are my, my, my two comments I, I, I would like to give. Fantastic. I'll give you a round of applause, Pfizer. Fantastic critique of the, of the position of uh, the description of what is business, et cetera. I agree with you. Fantastic. I agree with you perfectly well. Who has other views? Uh, before I come to expatiate on uh, what Faisal has said. Who has other views? Pump up, yes? Who has other views? Okay. So, so what, what Faisal said is, is completely right. You know, if you look at the, the, the character of what we call public, public sector, all right? The public sector, since uh, I think since uh, 19, 1992, especially uh, 1997, when the Labour Party came into power in England, all right? Now, they ascended to the throne on a common theory, you know, uh, on an emerging theory of what we call the third way, you know, which uh, Giddens, Anthony Giddens actually wrote in his book, you know, that describes the ideology of political parties and the formation of the movement of ideologies from the far and left, you know, uh, from the right and the left into what we call the center, all right? So the, the third way meant that when it comes to policy position, you don't necessarily have to have a policy that is purely right or purely left of center, but you can actually have a policy that actually sits within both the center and, and the, both the right and the left, meaning that you can aggregate towards or you can aggregate towards the middle ground to have a little bit of the left and a little bit of the right in between, all right, and then have a policy position. So that idea of the third way metamorphosed into a policy and programs of the new Labour Party, which they call PPP, which is Public-Private Partnership Arrangement where Labour Party, for example, changed its clause four to say that instead of saying redistribution of national wealth to everybody else, why don't we move towards the idea that the market would actually foresee the distribution of wealth. But then when the market falters, government will come in to actually you know, solve the lapses, to make sure that society is still kept intact. So the concept of PPP, uh, which is public-private partnership, led to a new kind of business that actually had public sector character and private sector character. I hope you are following the discussion. So we had you know, public sectors that actually were profit-oriented. They were not private people. They were companies that were initiated by government with private participation. And some of these companies actually were profit oriented, just like what you know, Pfizer was explaining. So you will find that the company is a public sector organization, all right, but it's, it's, public, uh, it's profit focused because it has private investment and it has private participation. So such institutions, for example, you couldn't call them a, a collection of private commercially oriented firms, all right? Then over time, we have what we call the social enterprises. So onward, we have, we, we, we began, and in this country, we began to hear the word NGOs, NGOs, you know, Saikara 1990s, when the liberalization was happening, Ghana was moving towards democracies and we saw, you know, uh, democratic uh, institutions or uh, CSOs that were, you know, uh, democratic oriented, but they were NGOs, all right? So we started hearing those words, NGOs. Now, the NGOs, over time, metamorphosed to what we call in you know, the social enterprises. 
some of them started taking on money, private money. But those monies were supposed to actually be turned around and to maintain the institutions. They were, so they were generally, you know, internally, you know, uh, uh, growth was facilitated internally, but they're not supposed to make profit. All right. So whatever they do or they make, I'm sure some of you, the lawyers in there can actually explain it much better than I do. But they were used to actually, you know, evolve or revolve and then to be sustaining. All right. So we, we started having businesses or institutions or, you know, uh, uh, structures that were called social enterprises. And those social enterprises, again, the characterization may differ from a purely private, you know, commercially oriented organization. But we still have to hold them to account, just like we hold, you know, these private organizations to account, as, you know, Faisal actually explained. So when you subject this business, you know, uh, discussion into, into critical contentions, you realize that the characterization and the definition have actually been changing towards other things as I've explained, all right? So in your critique of it, of course, this text actually says that, but you could actually critique it further if we have to, you know, discuss and debate it and then bring in these other aspects that I've talked about. Obviously, there are other characterization of, you know, what we call business, you know, in the offering. But of course, we can actually do with this explanation that I've given. Is that okay? And then Pfizer has actually given. Is that okay? Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay, excellent. Anybody has something to add? Anybody has something to add? Okay. All right. So now let's move on to what we call society. Who can critique it? Pump up. So we've described society, a community, a nation, a broad group of people, traditions, values, institutions, whatever. Who can actually critique what is here as society? Remember, we're looking at the business and its relationship with society and with the politics, etc. All right. But to actually understand how do we relate to this set of institutions and structures, we must appreciate who they are in order that we can identify them and relate to them as such, right? So who can actually explain or critique the society as explained here? Pump up, yeah? Who can do that? Who has a different perspective to society as explained here? Hello, guys. Linda? Yes, Doc. I think the definition is okay. Can you, can, you, can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? Because, Sandra, I want, yes, we can hear I want to gauge yes. that you can hear me because of the technicalities of the internet. Sometimes the thing is just tripped and you can't know that you can hear me or not. So, Sandra, I want to. Have we can hear you. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, who can critique the society here? Society is good to go. Mm -hmm. Who wants to try? Society. Uh, Daniel, your hand is up. Yes, Doc. Um, good evening. Uh, good evening, yeah. Well, um, in my critique, uh, what I'll go for is the commonality that's mentioned there. Um, mm -hmm. It says society is a community, nation, so on and so forth, with common traditions, values, so on and so forth. I think um, if we um, go on a higher level, we, would, we could say that a society um, could be a collection of smaller societies, um, mm -hmm. uh, smaller societies which may have these uh, common values and traditions mm -hmm. and institutions and so on. But mm -hmm. on a mm -hmm. macro level, we might find um, people who don't share um, mm -hmm. any of these values yeah. Um, institutions or uh, activities or interests, but they are a society together. Excellent. And um, you mentioned earlier on about uh, policy formulation and uh, how you cannot um, have a policy that is necessarily only good for one set of people. You have to find a middle ground somewhere. So um, I think that's the kind of situation we're dealing with, a society that doesn't have everything in common. So we have to Excellent. Um, cater to everyone's uh, Excellent. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, I, I side with you perfectly well. Uh, who can add a lot more to, you know, Daniel's before I come in to expand on, on, on his point? 
And then uh, who can even give examples to, you know, what Daniel just explained before I come in with some extra information. What, what does this definition of society point to you? Or what, what are some of the connotations, if I should put it? You know, what does it connect, uh, connotate, you know, that the society is? Yeah, okay. So let me add to what Daniel has said. If you, if you look at this definition of what society is, it's actually pointing us to a very geographic bound, isn't it? As if society is still the tradition, uh, the traditional society that we know, that we're used to, and that uh, people are supposed to be bound by space. You know, they're bound by space within a particular period. Because it says a, a, within a particular frame, because it says a community, a nation, a broad group of people, traditions, values, institutions, and collective, you know, interest. But increasingly, we have come to a time where society is online. Are you with me? So the concept of society as we know it, that society means, you know, greater Accra, that society means a group of people within a particular space, you know, that society means a group of people who belong to a certain tribe or a certain clan, you know, that kind of mentality of society is what is actually painted here as a picture of society. But increasingly, and as Daniel said, we are waking up to society of no connections at all. We're waking up to societies of no values. In fact, there are a lot of societies that have completely nothing in common, apart from one, maybe a conversation, a topic that they are discussing. But in, in, in its fairness, in its kind of description, people do not have, or they have very little in common, all right? And that is what we are actually waking up to. If you look at the netizens, or when you look at what we call internet communities, and I don't know how many of you have actually heard the word internet communities. How many of you have heard the word internet communities? All right, if you, okay, let me see some, some conversations here. It seems you are not recording. Yeah, okay, I'm recording now. Um, okay, if you're not speaking, music, okay. My definition of perfect, okay. All right, so, yeah. So when you look at the word internet communities, all right, we see that there are increasingly a group of people who would actually create a name and say, oh, we are recruiting people to join. Join for what? All that they have is perhaps, they just want to discuss online communities, yeah. So they just want to discuss, you know, daily issues that concerns them, all right? Of course, is that enough to describe or is that enough to actually fit this definition of society here? Perhaps yes or perhaps no, because the kind of thing that they are discussing does not necessarily makes them have one common values, all right? It's just a topic they want to talk about. In fact, increasingly we have seen very agile groups of people who actually come together to discuss one thing and immediately that thing is discussed and perhaps they're able to deal with it. They dis dissolve the group, you know, again. Within that particular moment that the group was formed, was that a society? Perhaps yes or perhaps no. So we can actually say that our understanding of society and that is where your appreciation comes in here. If your understanding of society means that a group of people who actually live within a certain vicinity or are bounded by certain geographical you know, uh, uh, points, you probably would dismiss a group of people who live online and whose actions actually affect your business. Am I making sense? Now, because your description of society does not include them. It's only for those who you think are within a particular areas, you know, a particular boundaries. So you are looking at group action or social action against you. And all of that you are looking at are whether there are some people somewhere that you can identify 
that are actually rising up against the operations of your business. But there's a group of people who sit online, but you don't actually consider them as what? As society and as a result, you don't consider their actions as actions that actually affect you. Why? Because your definition of what society is does not include them. And so you immediately discount them or you don't even have a clue what they're doing and how that actually affects you. Tomorrow, their actions are affecting you big time. But you couldn't have the appreciation of who they are and how they can impact on you. And so you didn't react to, to that. Am I making sense? Yeah? Fire yes, up. Sir. Yes. Yeah, your hand is up. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's um, I think I, I, I agree with what you are saying and what the earlier, uh, my elder co colleague said. Yeah. But one thing I'm taking from what you are saying mm -hmm. is basically, basically that the fiscal society which you live in, or let's say you operate in, mm -hmm. or the fiscal vicinity that you operate in as a business, mm -hmm. it is one society that is important, but extend the society beyond the physical. Mm -hmm. I think that that's basically what you're saying. That's right. Okay. Then also, what I'm also hearing you say is that even these online guys who may not physically be located where you are operating, mm -hmm. they also share a common purpose or a common concern or are purposely um, brought together by an, a particular issue. Mm -hmm which may concern your operation. So for instance, so let me just say for instance, you may operate a manufacturing company somewhere in Labadi. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're not handling your waste water very well. It is causing problems for people who live around them. Mm -hmm. Now, immediately your thinking is that your concern should be those who are living there. But if somebody goes there and maybe takes a video of what is taking place, and the skin diseases that, that your the waste water you are bringing out is generating, and put it online, you can bet today that you get people from from all over the world speaking down your product and virtually mobilizing the whole world against people buying your product. At that point, their interest is that they have a fellow feeling for those who are living Excellent. around where you are operating. Mm -hmm. So. Yes, so basically what, what I'm trying to say is that it means that no matter what the society, there is always one central point that makes the group or the persons in the group bound by an ideal or an issue or something. So yeah. that's for central in, in, in this whole definition of what a society should be. Excellent, excellent. So, so in that sense, you as you know the business person, especially in the capacity as a, a corporate, a, what do you call, a corporate relations or public relations director or sustainability director or a you know, CSR director. Your mindset about who a society is must be broad. You must have the open mind and you must be very, very observant to ensure that, you know, some of these people and some of these you know, a group of people may not necessarily be bounded by certain, you know, values, you know, but their activities when put together could be a problem for you. And so you are always thinking, which kinds of group of people could actually present you a challenge? And wow, or how must be your, or what must be your relationship towards this group of people? Just like, you know, Faisal has explained fantastically well. And that's all what we are actually trying to do. How do we appreciate the concept of business, the concept of society, the concept of politics, and let that appreciation inform our strategies and inform our relationship and our programs with these set of people? Bingo. That's exactly what we are talking about. Thank you so much, Faisal, you know, for, for that explanation. I hope it's clear for a lot of us. All right. So that's what we're talking about. The macro environment, you know, of stakeholders, you know, that exist within it, you know, how do we actually shape our relationship towards these stakeholders 
and these macro environments. All right. So the focus areas, as I said, we're looking at the managerial, you know, we're looking at the business sector, we're looking at sustainability, and we're looking at stakeholder management thinking. All right. And that's what we're looking at. Okay. So let's move to the next slide. And from the managerial approach perspective, let's pose this question. And I'm sure a lot of you would, would come in to, to discuss this issue. What are or what changes that are occurring or will occur in society's expectations of business that mandate business taking the initiative with respect to particular societal or ethical problems? You know, uh, it's a mouthful, right? But let's break it down. So it says, what changes are occurring? or will occur in society's expectations of business. So the kind of changes that are occurring that make society have a certain set of expectations of business. That mandates business taking the initiative with respect to particular societal or ethical problems, all right? And, and with this particular question, let's look at it. The issue, of, the issue of teenage pregnancy, all right? Very contentious one. You would ask yourself, as a business person, what has that got to do with you, all right? The issue of youth bulge, and I'm sure most of you have come across the word youth bulge before, all right? Uh, the idea that Africa has so many youth with no employment, all right? And it's becoming a problem for us continentally, you know, the youth bulge. And all these kind of societal issues, to what extent does that actually affect us as business people, or to what extent has business people contributed to these, these challenges, all right? These societal challenges. And, you know, to what extent does that present a challenge to us in terms of society expectation that we as business people have the mandate to help society solve some of these problems? Let's discuss this, you know, conversation. Let's, let's look at that conversation. Who, who, would, who would want to take the start? Okay. Um, in fact, the name is it what Abra? Ab, what, how do you pronounce Abra Kadabra? Abra Kadabra. Yes, that, sir. Your name no be smaller. <laughs> okay, Abra Kadabra. Let's start. Okay, let's go. Okay, so um, I will pick on the waste management. Yeah. As yeah. um as an issue which is um affecting the society. Yeah. So I believe yeah. most of the um, emerging and old companies are actually looking at a way to mm -hmm. um, keep the the issue on waste. Mm -hmm. So, if you could see, most of the manufacturing companies have actually outlined their whole goal mm -hmm. geared towards the sustainability approach, mm -hmm. where they look at sourcing um, sourcing. They look at sustainability from the sourcing part all the way down to wherever the end user might consume. So I'm just giving an example. In a case of, let's say, um, geisha, mm -hmm. the geisha soap. Mm -hmm. So the material used to, to produce the wrapper is actually sourced from a company where we have mm -hmm. um, the material actually going back into the land after a couple of times. It can dissolve by itself mm -hmm. after a couple of um, months or so. Mm -hmm. So businesses are actually looking on the way to to actually reduce their waste because it, it is more of a social problem now. Yeah. And once we businesses exist within these communities, mm -hmm. they are actually doing all they can to actually keep the issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Great point. So so the, the issue that you know Abracadabra is actually explaining, you know, let let's have a look at it uh, from this perspective. In the years gone by, do you think that corporations actually bothered about it? Perhaps no. Why? Because no. society itself didn't have that inclination. All right. Perhaps education was low. Perhaps, you know, our awareness that society or our awareness as a society that business actually was the, 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 the maker or was the generator of these pollutions was not there. Perhaps we had a kind of a society whose leadership connived with business to actually, you know, do some of these things 
without taking responsibility, and we didn't realize it. Perhaps our capacity to take on big businesses, all right, and to take on business and say that you are the problem, or you actually engineer this problem, and you must solve it, was not there. So we're looking at some of these changes that have, have happened in society. Society has grown. Society has become more, uh, what do you call, elitist, or society has become more educated, or society has become more aware, or society has become much more open, all right? Some of these changes have actually meant that businesses are now recognizing that if they don't own up to some of these issues and they don't take action, perhaps society can actually come at them because we are now much more aware than we used to be. We are now much more empowered than we used to be. The society is much more open. And so our leadership cannot actually connive with business to load on us their inefficiencies. And as a result, we may actually take action. So because of that, businesses are now opening up to societal <laughs> issues and making sure that they can own up to some of these societal issues and solve them. Just like what you know, Abracadabra is actually explaining. I hope I'm clear. You know, and the, the example was clear on that. Uh, who else wants to say something? Yeah, PD. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, from the, the macro level, or maybe yeah. from the government, yeah. changes are occurring in terms of our uh, tax system. Yeah. You know, previously, there was no uh, tax exemption for companies that site um, far away from the, the, the capitals. Yeah. For now, when, when you are citing beyond regional capital or when you are going to the district, there's a tax rebate for you. Yeah. So instead of you coming to site your, your plant closer to maybe the community or to maybe close to the port where you bring a lot of pollution in around where the people are, they are now telling you, as you go far, these are the benefits you are going to get in terms of uh, taxes. Excellent. So I think that is another change that it is happening um, in, the, in, the, in the macro level. Fantastic. Which means that there's a change in philosophy, all right? Yes. Our over, yes. overwhelming, you know, uh, our overwhelming or our uh, dominant view of benefits as only economic benefits is gradually changing. So government yes. and their philosophy of what is considered as benefits, tax benefits, which has predominantly been economic and be you know a uh, very cash oriented or money oriented is not changing to much more societal values all right yes. and part of that they're actually plugging into this and then beating this thing on the business and then business are responding you know accordingly fantastic idea yes. so the the changing philosophy of the political system and even of the social system is actually contributing to some of these changes fantastic point I hope you guys are actually noting them because notes none are here, you know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Notes none are here. So I hope you are noting that this point. Great point. All right, David. Let's listen to you. Hello. Yeah, David. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, your line your line is not clear. Yeah. I want to look at businesses. Can you hear me now? That's why. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you, David, now. Yes, I wanted to look at businesses today and uh, ethical deontology. You realize that before, businesses could just operate without recourse to societal values, mm -hmm. and they could go further to relieve gaseous substances and also the environment. Mm -hmm. And civil society wouldn't rise against them. But now it is virtually impossible for any company to engage in activities that are inhumane to the society. Civil yeah. society groups and their communities would become more egalitarian and mm -hmm. together and for their rights. Okay. So you can see that the practice of business today and ethics has been enlightened more in Okay. Okay. Society has become more enlightened and more egalitarian. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. So the point that David is actually saying is that there is even two fronts to the drivers. 
one from within. So business themselves, especially managers themselves, are becoming, are having changes in their philosophical approach that they are not being too much profit driven and they are becoming more society conscious, more value, value oriented, all right? But also the controlling factor is coming from society where society is becoming much more aware and much more value driven and much more egalitarian. So they're putting, it's as if that becomes a check on management in, in the way that management would actually, you know, uh, 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 what you call respond uh, 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 with, with their strategies, with their approach to make sure that they can respond to some of these societal pressures, you know, that actually emanates from the civil society and from the communities themselves. I think that's what, the, uh, uh, what you call David just, you know, uh, drove at, all right? Fantastic point. Yeah, any, any other person, anybody? Nawaz, you want to say something? Okay. Uh, Linda? No, sir. Something? Yeah. Linda? No, no, not quite, but I, I just wanted to say that I think a typical example of this is the mm -hmm. um, recent year with regards to COVID. Yeah. When you know, it commenced, we also realized that a lot of companies came on board to, you know, to support the government mm -hmm. um, fight the pandemic. Yeah. Is it yeah. appropriate to fight this it as is. an example it is. what we're discussing? Yeah, it is. All because right. now uh, business has realized that their contribution to society is not only taxes, all right, that they are not there just to make profit and pay taxes to, to, to government and say that they are good uh, uh, corporate citizens. Now, the idea of corporate citizenship has gone beyond tax paying, all right? Even to include more CSR, you know, uh, 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 activities. So people are now fundamentally saying that, yes, they may pay taxes all right. Government may misuse it all right. But when society is under pressure, just like COVID, business has a lot more at stake. And in fact, it is to their benefit because at the end of the day, the people in the society are your own people. You recruit from there, you get management from there, you get your raw, your raw, uh, raw material resources from there, and then you sell to them as well. So increasingly, if people get COVID and they can actually you know, participate in the economic sectors of life. Suddenly your business will collapse. You know? So Linda, you're right. The responses that we see from business towards this COVID is as a result of businesses you know, looking at their mandate as beyond tax paying to include other things such as societal, you know, responses or responding to societal needs such as COVID in order that they can actually solve. But they also see it as a legitimacy issue, you see, because to be a legitimate business or for people to see that you are a legitimate organization, what part are you playing in society? You pay taxes, it may not be seen by everybody. But then you contribute to COVID and you get a publicity. And people will be proud that they are buying from companies that have legitimacy, you know, within the system. Are you with me? So that is uh, part of the, 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 the issue that we are discussing now. Uh, great point. All right. So let's look at the next question. Did business in general or firm in particular have a role in creating these problems? Yeah, let's discuss. The issues that we've talked about, yeah. Yeah, you've lifted your hand. Thank you, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 please. Linda, uh, Linda, who, who is making that? Oh, okay. I've met her. Uh, yeah, thank you, sir. Yeah. Maybe I'm, 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 I, I want to play the devil's advocate. Yeah. I don't think businesses have changed yeah i think it is also it's always profit driven mm -hmm. it's just that they've realized that society has gotten smarter mm -hmm. so they, are, they are wolves in sheepskins trying to change the way they are doing business to get as much as they want i i'm saying this because it became clear during COVID mm -hmm. that everybody was in it for profit mm -hmm. let's forget all the nice ways we are talking about it mm -hmm. but yeah, I still think it is profit driven, not because they have a legitimacy to government or to they want tax, whatever they want money. Yeah, and at the end of the day, 
they keep on creating these same problems because at the core, mm -hmm. I think businesses are in for themselves, not for society. Okay. This is what I'm thinking. Uh, I stand to be. No, 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 no. You, you are right. I mean, uh, Samuel, you want to, I saw your hand up uh, before I add to Yao's point. Um, actually, what I was going to say was mm -hmm. also kind of in line with what he's saying. Yeah. In, businesses are usually they're trying to you know they're trying to position themselves it's about positioning yeah. Yeah. and branding and yeah. having the right image out there yeah so if society is concerned about this particular matter you have to show that you relate with society <laughs> yeah. that makes you appeal that, that that brings out your appeal to society yeah so then they are willing to actually buy your product or buy your service yeah. because they know oh this is one of ours this is for for us kind of thing so at the end of the day it comes down to the bottom line yeah that, that's what it comes down to it's just about doing it in a more relatable and humane way yeah um, yeah. yeah you know yeah. making use of all the all the weapons in the arsenal that's that's just about it excellent so, now I, I agree with you perfectly i'll add some points to that but linda come in before i add linda you lifted your hand Please, can you hear me? So with regards to what my colleagues, um, I mean, just came up with, mm -hmm. I am wondering whether genuineness in some of these things that the companies do or corporate, or corporate organizations do mm -hmm. is really necessary. I'm saying, I'm asking this because just about two or three days ago when we had the lecture with um, the gentleman who came in, yeah, I was, mean, in, yeah. in order to be able to push an agenda in the future, we were told that these are some of the things that you have to do. Yeah. So that if, if the time comes for you to do these things, you have a track record of having supported society. Yeah. You know, yeah. so in one way or the other, there's profit, but profit yeah. might not necessarily be monetary. <laughs> so yeah. I am wondering if, um, yes, they might have an ulterior motive, but either way, it's still profit, you yeah. know. Yeah. Is is that okay? Yeah. Oh. No, it's a it's a good point. You see, uh, it's a very good point, and that's it's a chicken and egg uh, conversation that we are having right now. All right, for those mm -hmm. for those who are from the philosophical position that the central point is profitability, they are not wrong. All right, and from those who are actually from the position that the central point is about legitimacy and it's about recognizing values, societal values and making sure that as a business, you play your part. You're also not wrong, all right? Now, it all boils down to the dominant philosophy of the management, all right? What does the management really think, you know? There are some management who are from egalitarian perspective, and I think David, David made that point uh, earlier. Was it David or uh, 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 made that point earlier about egalitarian thinking? You know, egalitarian means that you would actually want to think that society, everybody must benefit. Everybody must have, you know, that that uh, connection to production, you know, of, of, of life. But the issue is that the management that is making that decision to contribute to the COVID, all right, what is the philosophical, what is the mindset behind it? Is it, is it brand positioning as Samuel was actually talking about? Some of them, yes. This is a fantastic opportunity to brand position because the point is that we are in COVID. Nobody is looking at advertising, all right? So you pay so much money into advertising and nobody grabs your communication because we're in a very hard times, all right? And so your communication budget, if it's advertising driven, you're wasting money. So you have to move towards PR. Moving towards PR means that you're actually using certain PR mechanisms such as, you know, contribution to national issues, sponsorship, and all these things. And that's why you're going to have the free media, all right? And as Linda pointed out, when you do that, there are certain institutions when you now need to lobby them. They will say, oh, yeah, we saw you contribute to the national, you know, COVID campaign. Oh, that's fantastic, all right? At the end of the day, you have benefits in one way or the other, all right? But was that really the sole purpose? Were you actually brand positioning or were you actually using it for brand positioning? Or at the time of thinking, you actually contributing because society was suffering? Are you with me? So for me, both sides are right, all right? But the answer sits in the minds of the management. 
that is actually taking uh -huh. the decision. Whether the management is actually thinking profitability or business benefit, i.e. brand positioning, looking good in the eyes of the customer or looking good in the, acts of the, in the eyes of the government so that you can perhaps make a case for tax waivers, etc., which are all the reasons why people actually contribute to COVID. Or the management is actually driven by one thing, humanity. And as a result, they are making decisions. That none of us can tell. It would only reside in the, in the minds of the management that is making that decision. Are you with me? Yeah? Yeah. Come in. Yeah. So, 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 sir, so, sir, you, 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 if it sits in the hands of management, mm -hmm. then that goes to say that all that they do is for profit. <laughs> if you said it sits yeah. in the hands of the owners. Yeah, in the minds of them. If you sit in the in the minds of someone like Bill Gates, who is not not looking for profits, but probably looking for relevance and legacy, which is his profit, yeah. he might decide uh, to lose. Yeah. Yeah. But he's still, still for, he's still looking for profits. He's still looking for profits. Well, well, I, 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 I'm coming from the purely commercial point. Yeah. There's no manager who will be losing money and still sit in that position as a as a manager or as supervisory board. Yeah. So, the so existence of businesses of nowadays. Who is actually? It's Jody. Linda, is, is it Jody? Jody, ma'am. Jody, ma'am. Okay. Is it Judy or Jody, ma'am? Please mute your microphone. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Let's hear you. So, 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 at the end of the day, if if I do understand that, listen. Let me give the example of my company. Yeah. My company is a very huge international company. Yeah. Which which has existed for a very long time. Yeah. They were so instrumental in World War II. Yeah. But as we speak, they are the biggest company in that industry. Yeah. Why? Because they've learned to change their gap uh, mm -hmm. with with the with the system. When the system changes, they change. When the con whoa, there's a lot of feedback. Yeah. Uh, Jody, ma'am, please. Emmanuel, Emmanuel. Is it Emmanuel? Okay. Yeah. But so, 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 I, I see them shifting. Now yeah. they've realized that the, the European and American markets are choked, and Africa is the new frontier. Asia is the new frontier. They yeah. come in bearing gifts. Yeah. But at the end of the day, they made one statement that says that we know how to live long. Yeah. They know how to sustain their business for long time. Even from the war. Yes, they have been adapted. But at the core of the day, when we have a virtual shareholders meeting tomorrow, they are going to talk about profits because the shareholders are going to demand <laughs> for profit. Yeah. So that, so, so that is my point. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And that's why I was saying that, you know, yeah, the point that you made uh, is like chicken and egg, you know, uh, between you and then the, you know, Linda, you know, in Linda and, and the other guys position about common humanity. So sometimes the issue is that is the chicken brings that brings the egg or is the egg that brings the chicken? All right. Must do, do these businesses think humanity first and the other business objectives and the business goals actually follow? Or they think about the business objectives as a way of achieving the humanity goals. I don't know. So so these these answers or the, the strategy, the approach of whether you want to go business objective and you use it to achieve humanity uh, goals, or you look at humanity and you use that to achieve business goals. I think we sit very well with the management and their philosophy, you know, going forward. And just like you have actually described perfectly well, yeah. Some businesses actually will argue that we are not in for, for that Christmas. It's a business and we are in for profit. However, the, 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 the issue of humanity and the humanity or humanitarian objective is as a consequence of our profitability because some businesses will tell you that until they make profit, they cannot do the human, humanity business, all right? And then some people will tell you that the humanity business or the business, business objectives is as a consequence of humanity because when you do good, the ripple effect is that people will see your business as the best 
and they would actually buy from you and then you will exist forever. So these two sides of the argument, I think they hold, but the answer is in the minds and in the heads of the management that is making that decision. Are they making the decision for humanitarian reasons? Or are they making the decision for purely business reasons and its consequences becomes humanitarian? You know, just like you, you, you just said. Uh, yeah. All right, uh, Emmanuel or Kenneth, was it Kenneth? Who, who lifted their hand? Yes, Kenneth. Kenneth, okay. Ah, uh, yes, I just want to be, um, make a contribution. Yeah. Um, if you take an example of the tobacco companies. Yeah. So, um, tobacco was a big thing back in Europe uh, and even in Africa. For yeah. That matter. And um, there, a lot of studies came out that tobacco causes lung cancer and all these kind of diseases and stuff. But what did the tobacco companies do? They adopted. They became the, they were at the forefront of uh, actually advertising and uh, the the effects of tobacco mm. to you. But the question will be asked that did that did they actually do that to um, to drive away their customers or just purely for for, uh, for profit? Mm. I think yeah. they were under pressure to do that. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, and 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 majority of them actually were given a lot of money to research firms, you know. To, to do this research, I mean, to clinics, try, I mean, uh, work on lab, lab, uh, what do you call it, test, et cetera, and then getting these, these kind of responses. So one question that people will ask is that if they were not interested in humanity, why would they spend so much money, you know, towards this research about the tobacco and its effect on human beings, et cetera? All right, so these are some of the philosophical questions that... Look, can I say something on that? Yeah, yeah, say something. So particularly about something like tobacco. Yeah. I mean, for a long time, now history tells us that for a long time, they actually fought that truth of mm -hmm. tobacco causing lung cancer. It had, you, you had to take the efforts of whistleblowers, and some people lost their lives, lost their job for yeah. things like this. So it was more of, to me, it's more of the pressures of society in that... Mm -hmm. Um, it comes to a point where you cannot fight the truth anymore. Mm -hmm. And now it's, it's widely known. And if it's widely known, you have to just change your position. Mm -hmm. So it basically comes back to that. Mm -hmm. It's about profitability. We have to change our position. And it was, it's, uh, it was also, I mean, they were man mandated to do so mm -hmm. by, by the courts and by the yeah. regulatory bodies and That's things correct. like that. If it wasn't yeah. that, they wouldn't have. Yeah. They would have liked to still maintain their position of, no, it's safe, it's fine. Yeah. But yeah. then the evidence showed that, no, you, you, you cannot keep towing this line because it's a yeah. lie. So they and have they, to come And out. they kept sponsoring counter evidences. Exactly. Yeah. They, sp they sponsor counter <laughs> research and things yeah. like that because right. it's a fight for money. Yeah. It's yeah. a fight for money. So then again, it comes down to the issue of, to me, it's all about profitability. Once you're setting up your business, you're setting up your business to make profit. If you're having equity investors, you're taking on you know, credit, you need to make money to repay all these people that mm -hmm. give dividends. It comes yeah. down to profits. I mean, if we go into the, the, the space of politics, mm -hmm. I mean, politicians, at the end game is to win. That's mm -hmm. the thing. The end game is to win. If there's a disaster somewhere, and then you, you have to get on it quickly. Okay, I have to be there. I have to show my support. Mm -hmm. I have to be there for the people. If you don't and your opening goes there early before you, you are losing you the election. Exactly. So <laughs> it's all about the end thing is to win. Okay, you excellent. Know? All right, great debate. All right, thank you. Now let's yeah. look at the next question. Now, um, can we reduce broad social problems to a size that can be effectively addressed from a managerial point of view, i.e., can business really solve society's problems? Can we reduce broad social problems to a size that can be effectively addressed from a managerial point of view? Yes, we're debating. Who wants to start? Sir, sure, can I? Yeah, you can. This is your. Yeah. Um, I, I have a, a, a simple uh, example. Mm -hmm. There's a company in Germany that used to uh, produce uh, a particular item. Mm -hmm. And it was so good that the item wasn't 
reaching its maturity uh, lifespan. It, it just worked. Mm-hmm. And that company went out of business. <laughs> yeah. I'm saying this because businesses need to create problems that they would solve. Otherwise, they don't remain relevant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If we have solved the problems in this world today and there are no new problems to solve, mm-hmm. businesses will collapse. Mm-hmm. That is why nowadays they keep on coming up with the rhetoric, this is good, this is better than the previous years. But when you take an example of your Mercedes, 1980 Mercedes, mm-hmm. and you compare it to your 2020 Mercedes, your 2020 Mercedes has all the Bluetooth and all that gadgets, mm-hmm. and it has become a China, a China phone. Because it has so, it does so many things and it creates so many problems that in two, three years, you have to buy another Mercedes so that Mercedes-Benz or Daimler Chrysler will continue remaining in business. So I think businesses solve old problems and create new ones that are on scene mm-hmm. so that they can solve them and continue remaining relevant. Relevant. Okay. Great point. Now, let me read a point from David. I'm sure uh, David says that some two big companies refused to support a guy, you know, uh, that had a, a kidney transfer issues. Now, for a very short period of time, they saw this company donating to COVID-19. <laughs> so, so, so the point is that, is the business and its societal issue, humanity, or for profit, you see? So they are seen contributing to COVID-19, but they were contacted, you know, to actually help somebody with a transplant and they refused. These are some of the typical examples. And by the way, so some of the things that discussion that we're having. All right, so what I was actually explaining, and, and, and the point is that- Prof, can I come in? Yeah, I win. Yes, you can come in. Yeah. So I, I sincerely think there is no business that exists um, in present moment without solving a social problem. Mm-hmm. I think every single business that you find around um, is created to solve a societal problem. Mm-hmm. Um, people need to eat, right? So um, it's a social problem when there's hunger. Mm-hmm. Most entrepreneurs will find a solution to that. People need to move around. Mm-hmm. There's Uber to make it easy and affordable to do that. Yeah. As much as the the, the business contract con, construct mm-hmm. is in favor of profit making, it is actually a survival. The sustainability of a business is dependent on how close is it to solving the current needs of humanity. Mm-hmm. I don't believe that businesses are created. Um, to, to, to create problems to solve them. Mm-hmm. I believe businesses are always created by entrepreneurs who cannot withstand just watching these problems exist. Mm-hmm. But the way they will sustain the business operation is to constantly make profit, mm-hmm. which is the way that they will sustain. It's not, I, I don't think profit, I, I always believe that profit is number two. Yeah. Solving the problem is number one. Yeah, okay. Great point. You see, the reason I'm, I'm smiling is that Right here in this class, we see two managerial styles and managerial philosophies, right? So immediately you can tell that a group of managers and the, their actions and their managerial style and another group of managers emerging and their actions and managerial So you can clearly see from this, this class. And that's exactly what pertains out there. Of course, in the businesses that you guys work in, you can even tell much more than I do about the philosophy of your management. And some of you, you are part of the management anyway. So you can tell the philosophy that you actually have, et cetera. Nawaz, you two come in. No, I cannot come. Yeah, yeah, let Nawaz come then. Yakubu, you will come follow. You will follow. All right. Yeah. Nawaz, we are listening to you. Nawaz, are you hearing us? Okay, Yakubu, you can come in when uh, he comes in. Okay, no. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm coming from the food industry. Yeah. Uh, co-organizations supposed to be solving problems. Mm-hmm. But one way or the other, they are creating problems and making more profit. Okay. In the rice business, 
rice industry. Mm. Initially, when rice was not refined or polished, mm -hmm. the shelf life of the rice grain was very short. Yeah. So they start processing it mm -hmm. by way of extending the shelf life. Mm -hmm. But when they, uh, when they process the rice grain, mm -hmm. the main ingredients, so the main nutrients in the grain mm -hmm. are on the surface of the rice grain. Okay. So those called bran, rice bran, which is being taken out, that when you take it naturally, it's supposed to help repair worn out tissues in your system. Mm -hmm. Now they take the rice out, the bran out of the grain, and extend the shelf life of the rice, where, and with no time, people develop problems, then they go back to repackage the bran which was taken out, as nutritional supplement for customers to buy again. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So in the long run, you realize that majority of businesses are profit oriented, but managerial position point of view, they can correct it. But because of profit, they won't do it. <laughs> okay. Good point. All right. Fantastic point from, from uh, Yakubu. Yeah. Um, Eben. Let's listen to you. I think the conversation is getting interesting. Yes, sir. My, my, oh, my point is also uh, that whether or not uh, it's for profits or uh, for the promotion of society's needs, yeah. I think that it comes back, whether it's for, it's, for, it's for profits, I mean, I think it comes back to helping society because then uh, a company will expand when it's able to make profits, or economies of scale, yeah. then it... Uh, opens brand branches, you know, elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Then it comes back to employing so society's right. members. So I think yeah. that whether it's for profit, yeah. it, it is for the good of society. Exactly. Yeah, because because the employment of people is part of societal good, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. That, that's a good point. Yeah. Rejoice. Your hand was up. Okay, so I don't know if this fits in completely. It should. It but should. then. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> with regards to um, the den clearance processes with customs, where um, supposing you uh, decide to import a rice into the mm -hmm. country, mm -hmm. you would need to more or less submit over 33 to 34 documents for processing. Mm -hmm. But with the current trade facilitation policies and procedures, mm -hmm. there is a portal that more or less um, absorbs all documents and then also reduces the input points for you to more or less um, put in your information as one mm -hmm. in a single sort of like um, yeah. uh, probably your name and address through mm -hmm. several portals but yeah. just through one portal for your clearance processes to be sure. Yeah. So in this situation, I believe the government, one way or the other, seeks to address societal issue rather than going so much yeah. for the profit. I, I get your point. So you are saying that business models are developed to respond to societal issues. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And you are giving a typical example where in the past regime, and when I say regime, I mean the process of doing things, you yes. used to submit about 36 kinds of documents. And yes. somebody sits down, develops a new business model, whereby yeah. they can reduce the process to a barely just about one upload, isn't it? Yes. And, and that yes, was to exactly. affirm the position that businesses are actually set up to solve societal issues and to help humanity. Fantastic point, you know, fantastic point. But of course, they would have to be paid for their, for their effort, isn't it? They, they, they have to actually be paid for it. Fantastic point, great point. Yes, uh, I saw some hands up as well. Maybe we can take one or two, then we can move on. Yeah. Hello, Doug. Yeah, now us. Yeah, so I was trying to make a point. I, I disagree with my earlier colleague who said businesses create problems and solve them and all that. Let's take a company like MTN Ghana. Yeah. MTN 
they even help communities that they don't even have their marks being mounted over them. Most of the time, we see them doing programs or social intervention programs in communities that they have their marks mounted due to some of the health risks that it will pose to the community dwellers. Mm -hmm. But they build schools and even they even build hospitals for communities that they don't even operate in. Yeah. They haven't created any problems over there. Yeah. But, now, but now they are being what? Now, as, they me, are solving let me, societal now, issues. Now, as, let me add to those points. Those who were raising those points, like Samuel and Co., Yao and Co., that yeah. point was that businesses will not deliberately create problems. That's not what they mean. But they're yeah. saying that embedded in it, is a problem creation for them to benefit. That's their position. So their position is that it is not necessarily that businesses are deliberately going out to create problems for them to actually benefit. But they're saying that the art of business and the art of opportunity finding in itself is a problem creation process. In order that okay. part of your, your model to solve it, the benefits in return. So the focus is now on profitability as opposed to on humanity. They, 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 don't, they, don't, they are not actually saying that they go out there and create problems for everybody, else, but they are saying that sure. the idea, the philosophy of solving societal problems, it is not the key focus of business, but rather profitability as a topmost consideration for solving the problem. Are you with me? And I think, okay. I think, yeah, I think I've represented you guys your view very well, right? That's what they, they meant. Okay, thank you. That's okay. All right, so let, guys, let's let's move on uh, with other questions. All right. So, um, the next question says that, what are the specific problems, alternatives for solving these problems, and implications for management approach to dealing with social issues? All right. And, and, and with this, people have come across to say that social issues can only be solved by economic solutions, all right? And uh, we are actually answering these questions. You know, these problems that we are we're actually raising, all right, cannot, can they only be solved by economic solutions? And people refer to America, all right? The people refer to capitalist you know, economy yeah, that say that. in countries where there are jobs for everyone, in countries where there are food for everyone, their crimes are reduced. And so there are people who actually theorize that in order that for us to solve social problems, we must look at the economics, all right, and make sure that we are creating more jobs and putting more money into people's pockets. Do you guys agree? I mean, what are the specific problems, alternatives for solving these problems and its implications for management approach to dealing with society? So some management actually think that government solution to our problems that we have now is more business, all right? Others think otherwise. Let's discuss. Yeah, so who will start? Who will start? Remember, we're looking at business and society. You know, business and society. What is our relationship with society? And so these questions. You know, do we think that the solution to our social problems is economics, i.e. creating more jobs, getting more money into people's pocket? Now ask. So I think um, sometimes some of the issues might be economical, but some of them too aren't. An example is the issue of um, sanitation. <laughs> If you look at our sanitation issue in this country, you realize that most citizens need education about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they need to be educated on the need of keeping our surroundings clean, not throwing rubbish into drainages and all that. Mm -hmm. I think it's the education that's needed. It's not necessarily money that has to be pumped in constructing more drainages and all that. Some of the areas that are flood-prone areas, you realize that the drainages are there. But because of the habit of what those living around a place like Nima, for example, there's a very big gutter over there, yeah, which can contain the flow of water, yeah, because they dump refuse and all sorts of things into the drainage. The place end up being choked, and when it rains, the people are those being what affected. Okay. So with such a problem, I think it's education that's needed. 
Okay. So now I was saying that we can solve our problems not only through economics, but through education, which means that if we are actually planning your CSR activities, all right, as because all these things that we're learning, we're actually linking it to our strategies at work. Why must we see societal problems? How do we, or how must we see them? And how must we strategize in helping to solve them, all right? And one of the questions is that, you know, the problems that we are having, the social problems that we are having, well, how best can we solve them? And I'm saying that some people think the social issue that we have is actually economic one, which means if we solve the economic problems, we solve the social issues. And the last point is that perhaps it may not be the case. One of the key things about education, not necessarily money in the pocket of people, etc. All right, who else has another debate? Who else has another one? Yeah? Let's talk about issues. Remember, we're looking at macro level issues. As managers, sometimes we find it tough. Uh, we don't find even the space to discuss some of these social issues. So let's, let's have a conversation. Who else? Who else think that solution to our social issues is more economic, more money? And who else agree with Nawaz that it's about education? Abina, you want to say something? Vicky, your hand is up. Vicky. Hello, hi. Hello, um, yeah. Doc. I want yeah. to say something. I yeah. think um, it's in relation to the sanitation. Yeah. Because this um, documentary that I once watched in relation to, um, I don't know whether it's Singapore. Yeah. Um, yes, you realize that even with their sanitation problem, they didn't solve it um, through education. They also had other ways by recycling some of these refuse into energy. Yeah. So when you go there fiscally, you don't even see a fiscal rubber. Most of them are being bent. Mm -hmm. And then the, uh, the sort of things that they bend with it, it creates energy, as in electricity for the people. Yeah. And then the fumes are being filtered in such a way that those air that comes tends to be clean. So I'm also thinking that sometimes in our um, attempt to solve a problem, we can apply technology whereby we can use it to create, let's yeah. say, a new business Excellent. or create a new venture. Yeah. Okay. I agree with you. So, innovation and technology can be a response, all right? All right, great point. Awin. Awin, let's hear you. Awin, or oh, Gideon. I think, I think it, it okay, I made my point. That's She's made my point. Uh, we yeah. can move on. All right, Gideon. Yeah, Doc, yeah. Mine, is, uh, mine is not in uh, so much relation to what we are discussing. Um, yeah. I think myself and a, whole, uh, a number of others are having uh, a bit of some internet challenges. So oh, okay. I, 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 I don't know when the recorded version will be available for some of us so we can... Um, 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 Okay. grasp exactly what happened today because today has been a very Terrible challenging thing. time for some of us right. yeah I, 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 the recording is always available but the file is big so i try to find a way of transferring it i'll try and see what i can use we transfer to transfer to linda and find a way of transferring it all right okay yeah, i'll try as much as possible okay uh, abra abracadab abracadab your name Abra yes sir you are right, Abracadabra. <laughs> so, so my, um, in as much as I believe in uh, solving the social issues with uh, economic, economic, uh, uh, how do you call it, the strength or whatever, yeah. I also strongly believe that um, we can solve social issues when we actually have a right attitudinal change and a growth mindset. Why do I say this? Because um, I believe in the developed world where they are, they, they are law-abiding citizens, they obey the law and they go by the law. Things are made easier for institutions to be run. Yeah. And when you come to the third or developing world, it's, it's vice versa. Yeah. So I believe if there is, there is a need for us to also become, um, how do you call it, so, so solve in, social issues. Yeah, so instilling values. Making yes. sure that we can instill values in people. 
and that could more have like yes us, yes help us yeah problems great point yeah yeah let's listen to you look i i i have i have this uh, Maslow's theory of needs has been ringing in my head since I saw these societal problems. Yeah. America is very capitalist, but yeah. they have more problems than Ghanaians. <laughs> A lot of people when would disagree with you. When, when it comes to Africa, we are hungry. So we are the basic, basic needs. Basic needs I, I, think, I think businesses have, record, have realized that humans like women would never be satisfied. Hey, this is controversial. Hey, you all messed up. Please wait. I, that was a joke. Yeah, I, 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 I beg you. 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 I you. I said, <laughs> I am joking. You let me finish my point. Also, the one you can accommodate and be with, please. Not all. Oh. Hey, hey. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah. Hey, hey. Uh, uh, hey. about hey. to change. Calm, yeah. Something else. Yeah. Yeah. Calm down. No, yeah. please let me finish. Woman can do it. Allow it. Allow it. Yeah, it's good please. to know that the class is. It's good to know the class is active. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. It is. <laughs> According to Maslow's theory of needs, yeah. the moment we satisfy one level of need, we go to the next. Yeah. And businesses have realized. And therefore, society, we've tried so many ways to solve business problems. We've even gone to do communist. We've gone to do uh, dictatorials. We've gone to do democracy. We've done a lot of things to solve the problem of human need. Yeah. But I think businesses have realized that no matter what you do, there will be a new need. Yes, and therefore... We, we they adapt so yeah. it has become like COVID. It, it is with us so we just manage the situation and make as much of it as we, we can okay. and move forward okay so your point that you're making is that the the problems of society we have a lot of models we've tried a lot of models there's nothing that we can actually get stranglehold of so we just have to live with it and move forward all right so that's the point that you have said that okay now daniel Daniel. Yes, um, hello. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I'm thinking uh, advocacy uh, could be one of the ways to uh, deal with social issues from the uh, business point of view. Um, if a problem is identified and say the business uh, the business organization sees that it's not a problem they can solve by themselves, maybe they will need um, government um, assistance in terms of uh, formulation of policy or something. Mm -hmm. uh, they can advocate mm -hmm. for um, government to take action in terms of instituting a policy okay. that would help to solve the problem. Okay. And this kind of advocacy may not be um, in the public um, eye uh, because of maybe uh, sometimes the victim mentality that yeah. the public might have if they yeah. uh, understand what they uh, okay. organization. Now, fantastic perspective. So, Daniel, what you're saying is that business could use its influence to champion advocacy or to actually you know, uh, 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 help solve, you know, societal problem through advocacy, because obviously business could have influence on government and therefore can influence policy. Business could have influence on society and therefore can influence societal behavior. I think that's a fantastic perspective. So it is not only about money uh, and it is, it is not only about uh, uh, social and education, but it's also to what extent does business be, brings its, its muscle in order that they can push advocacy to solve societal problem. Fantastic. I think that's a good point as well. All right, Samuel. So I actually think it's a combination of different components. I mean, yeah. the economics, the advocacy, the social interventions. It's a combination of all of that because if you're looking at societal problems, the problems there there are a lot and they are in layers. Mm -hmm. There are some things that enabling institutions to enforce certain laws will solve. Mm -hmm. And it may not solve it all the way. It may solve it to a certain extent mm -hmm. that you need certain um, business solutions to come in to mm -hmm. complete. Mm -hmm. So then that over there, you have the economics um, aspect of it. So okay. in a society, 
um, a lot of things are not so straightforward. You have different factors and different dynamics. Mm -hmm. You have different components to make the whole part. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what it is. You can't just have a, a, a one side of it. It will be Excellent. a component of things. Excellent. Guys, you are having your business solutions right from here, right from <laughs> this class. <laughs> you know? So the point, the point we are making is that uh, business and society, you are sitting in the, at the round of the table with your bosses. And they're actually saying, guys, we are confronted with social issues. How do we actually address them? Then the ideas are coming in from all corners and they are looking at the CSR, the boss of the CSR, and saying, eh, do, we, do we actually go here? Do we have it? And that's exactly the answers that we are providing here. That perspectives that business could use in solving social issues can be diverse. The issues can be diverse. And if you look at it from one you know, picture, as, as Yah was talking about, which, you know, Samuel has actually emphasized. Look, business or society has tried so many modules, so many modules. Some say capitalism will work. Some say, no, it wouldn't. Those days, some say uh, communism was the way forward. We didn't, we're not successful. Some said socialization, uh, uh, socialism. Some say big government. We tried all these, it didn't work. And we are still getting through it. And that's what Samuel is saying. We could have so many perspectives, but I think that the best way to approach it is have a comprehensive view. But don't forget, Samuel, resources are not infinite. I mean, business resources are very finite. So the comprehensiveness of the approach would also depend on the budget that business yeah. has to execute its mandate. And remember, mandate. business actually works on objectives and they are time bound, all right? And don't mm -hmm. forget the influences of you know, uh, shareholders or stakeholders is also at play. So mm -hmm. in, in, in as much as we want to be so comprehensive enough in our approach, we still have to be guided by resources and resource constraints. And time That's why there will always be problems. Mm -hmm. Because they won't be <laughs> totally yeah. taken care of. So there will always be problems that will have to be dealt with. Exactly. Great point. All right, Charlie, I've enjoyed this class. All right, let's move to the next point. So we're saying that the, the urgent versus enduring issues, we have to be mindful as businesses that the society's issues that we actually confront may be under this continuum. There are some that are urgent. There are some that are enduring issues. All right. Uh, urgent means that the issues may be short term. They need immediate attention. There are some issues too that are persistent. They've been with us for God knows how long. Issues such as unemployment, all right? They have been with us from Adam. And as President Kufo said, corruption is like you know, prostitution. It's been with us from Adam, all right? Now, some of these issues, <laughs> you know, some of these issues, they, they, they will be with us for, for so long. So if we have to actually think about committing business resources to solving them, we may be wrong because we can't solve them, all right? So in our identification of the social issues and our attempt to solve them, we must actually group them into these continuum. What are the short-term urgent issues that we probably can marshal business resources to solving them? And what are the long enduring ones that will probably have to be managing them throughout the lifespan of the business and making sure that we actually can coexist with the society without being actually say that we are very bad corporate citizens and we have abandoned these things. We have to have the fine balance between them. Those urgent ones that we can actually deal with and those, you know, long enduring ones that we must actually manage, you know, from that perspective. Anybody want to say something about this, or we can move on? Yeah. Any anybody wants to say something about this? Okay. Now, let's look at business ethics. All right. Uh, another topical issue when it comes to our relationship with society. You see, the when it comes to ethics. And the idea of ethics actually is not something that is binding. And I'm sure those of you who are lawyers, 
I mean, you can explain some of these theories much better than I do. But we're saying that ethics refers to issues of right, wrong, fairness, and justice. And that's exactly the problem, all right? What is fair? What is right? What is wrong? And what is justice actually has a very wide perimeters because they are very contextual, isn't it? They depend very much in, on the context of where we were born, where how we were raised, you know, the kind of conversation we've been up to, the kind of views, exposures that we've been, we've been up to. And they all define our ethical stance, all right? It's universal, the idea of ethics, but some way, somehow, they are also confined to places, all right? And just as when you look at you know, the political lenses, all right, for those who had actually lived in uh, what we call compound houses, all right, from their childhood growing up, they have a completely different ideological set from people who have lived in estates and they've lived in uh, what is called bungalows, all right? Now, what we meet at the melting point, which usually is the high school, all right? We meet at the boarding houses and things. You see a clear distinction of people who have lived in compound houses and people who have lived in bungalows. Why? Because the compound house person feels that the way to express love, all right, and, you know, togetherness and unity is about, you know, eating from your chop boxes, etc. Now, the person who is actually coming from a very rich home or compound houses and things, they are not into this sharing, you know, of, of, of things. They are not into... Let's share your uh, tin up, let's share your, your Gary and things. Their definition of love is completely expressed in different ways. Are you going to say that they are right or wrong in the expression of love? Are you with me? So we find that ethics issue very, very, very confounded and very difficult to grapple with, especially from business perspectives where people have moved from all walks of life into one business environment their ethical stance and their ethical predispositions are completely different. So how do you then make sure that ethics become the guiding principle of your decisions and of your actions? So somebody calls in sick, all right, or somebody calls in and say, oh, my, my, uh, my next door neighbor is not well, and because of that, I can't come to work. Or my uncle is not well, and because of that, and this manager who is coming from a society that some of these doesn't exist. It's a hard day you tell me that your next door neighbor is not well. How does that actually influence your decision to come to work or not? If you don't come, I will suck you. And then somebody say, ah, this guy is so mean. He, you, you, you understand the point I'm making. So <laughs> it becomes so difficult in you know, navigating these, you know, some of these issues within the business society kind of discussions. Who has a contribution to make or a question to ask on this? We're discussing the word business ethics and that refers to right or wrong, fairness and justice and how that govern our decision-making you know, and our interrelationship within the business society contest as we're talking about. Who wants to add that? Doc, can I come in? You can come in, Romeo. Okay, this is Yakubu. Oh, Yakubu, sorry. Okay. 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 On the corruption aspect that you mentioned. Yeah. Like Hello, in the compound yeah. houses. Oh. Yeah. In the compound yeah, houses. Remy. Sorry. Yakubu, sorry. Just a minute. Remy. Okay. Yeah, Doc. Yeah. I want to ask a question. Okay. Let Yakubu. Hello. Finish. Yeah. Let Yakubu finish and then we'll come to oh, you. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Yakubu. Okay, what okay, are the okay, point yeah, I'm, thank you. Yeah. The point I'm driving at is mm -hmm. in the compound houses long, long ago. Yeah. Concerning corruption. Yeah. When you send a child, mm -hmm. there was no point tipping the child or giving something to the child. Mm -hmm. But along the line, mm -hmm. people started giving it to if I send you to do something for me, I'll give you a tip. Yeah. Then right away from that point, in the minds of the child, yeah. 
But when you say, when someone send you, he or she is supposed to give you something in return. Yeah. And so as time goes on, mm -hmm. it develops into the minds of our people, mm -hmm. and then corruption starts from that point. So quick pro quo. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Yakumu, what you are saying is that at some point we left <laughs> that value, or there was a there was a transformation of that value within the uh, the the social setting, where sending that did not necessarily mean I have to tip you. And immediately we started introducing tips into that society. Corruption started. That's the point you made, right? Okay. Yes, sir. Excellent. Abina, let's listen to you. Okay, Doc. I would like to make a contribution. Yeah. Um, oh, Doc. Yeah, Romeo. Uh, sorry. Let's but, um, with ethics. Yeah. Okay. So um, with ethics, I think it's got to do with the society one finds him or herself in. Um, let's look at the um, foreign countries as yeah. an outside um, the, um, Africa, the mm -hmm. Europe, and then the America. Yeah. It is ethically right mm -hmm. for a customer to tip. Um, a service rendering officer, let's say you go to the restaurant after eating or something, it's yeah. so right to tip um, whoever that served you. Mm -hmm. But let's bring it down here. Mm -hmm. We see it as so far as I've paid for the service, there's nothing, you, you have no right to demand for tip or something. Yeah. So over here, let's say um, with the banks, yeah. Um, when a customer goes to the banking hall and um, after the teller has served him or her, the person feels like, oh, let me give you something just for, you know, um, being nice to me or being um, speedy about rendering yeah. service to me. Mm -hmm. But here, um, the bank will see it as it is wrong. It is ethically wrong for you to accept a tip. Mm -hmm. from the customer. So I think it depends on the location or the society that you find yourself in. Excellent. All right. Yeah, Romeo, let's listen. Look, even, 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 even depending, even with the bank, outside the person giving the teller a tip, some of them, they end up building a kind of relationship with that customer. When the customer comes to the bank and there's even a queue, mm -hmm. they tend to serve that customer because the customer has been tipping them, which okay. is no good. Okay, so, yeah, you, are so saying that, it's, it's, you are saying that the, the resulting effect is what is actually making the, 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 the kind of uh, out, out, outcome that tip shouldn't be encouraged because... People... Exactly. Okay. Now, yeah. Romeo, Romeo, let's listen to you. Sorry. Yes, sir. No. Tip down you. Yeah. Uh, my, my is a question. Yeah. Uh, I've observed that ethical issues in business must uh, align with companies' vision. Mm -hmm. Because uh, there is a school of thought that believes that companies that are doing well now, mm -hmm. they are uh, issues of ethic align with, meaning all the people working there, they have a culture. Yeah. They speak same language. Yeah. They speak same language. Yeah. And they do very, very well because of the way they align themselves with their ethical values. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right. So now, that, 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 that's my question. Yeah, mm. yeah. You're, you're right because you see, the, the terrain of ethics, as we said, is a very, it's a yeah. very broad. Road. So you need a kind of guideline mm. that could actually guide everyone's behavior. Because as I said, sure. we are all coming from different places. Some are from compound houses, some are from bungalows. All right. Now, if you leave the ethical question to our interpretation and to our behavior. There will be a diverse, you know, and there will not be uniformity, which means that customers may experience different level of service from the same staff of the same company, all right? So companies that actually do well are the ones who actually yeah. enshrine ethical conduct into their procedures to make sure that each and everybody can actually be at, sure. uh, 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 at the same you know, level of understanding yeah. 
and can actually execute the same level of ethical yeah. uh, conduct uh, with the, with the, uh, to, the, to the customer. And that's why people, companies who actually subscribe to one ethical code actually do, do well. All right. Great point. Uh, okay. Yeah, very yeah. Well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. To add up with, to add up with uh, what my brother said, when you take yeah. a company like Uber, if you use their app, it's fully indicated on the app that tipping is allowed. So it's an organizational decision that they have taken that okay. tipping is allowed. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, Gideon, your hand yeah. is up. Gideon. Oh, I'm sorry. I think I didn't blow it the last time I spoke. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. Is your hand as well up as well? Yes, it's, it's up. I have a question. Um, and this is my question. Yeah. When, when we speak about ethics, I see a clash of cultures. Mm -hmm. Most of our ethic documents were imported from Europe or America. Mm -hmm. But the issue of ethics, as you've rightly placed it, it's a cultural issue. Mm -hmm. One good example, in this part of the world, when your customer dies, mm -hmm. our culture, you, you do something for your customer because mm -hmm. you have a relationship. Our business is relationship built. Mm -hmm. Over there, they don't have that. They have social media for their relationship. Mm -hmm. So when you do something for your customer, that is not ethical. Mm -hmm. And we have borrowed it to our part of the world. And there's a lot of confusion. Mm -hmm. I just want you to talk about it. The okay. second issue is that I, I met this British guy in 2017, somewhere. Mm -hmm. And during that time, we were all having lunch and everybody was talking about the corruption in Ghana. Mm -hmm. And the guy was quiet. He's a very old British guy. So mm -hmm. after a while, he told the other British guys that you people are complaining about Africa. Mm -hmm. and we taught them how to be corrupt. Mm -hmm. We taught them how to be corrupt mm -hmm. because per their culture, they didn't know anything like corruption. So the issue of ethics and corruption and Kufo saying that it has been with us, it is not part of our culture. The word corruption is not even part of our culture. Mm -hmm. But now businesses are determining what is ethical. That is why in my brother's case, somebody needs kidney transplant. The business will not uh, attempt to that, but they would have done it to COVID. Because yes. per their ethical culture, it is not, it's a, it has now been taken from the remit of culture Mm -hmm. to the remit of Western European business. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there's a clash with, in, in Africa when it comes to ethics. Mm -hmm. Okay, great point. Now, Adam said nobody taught anybody how to be corrupt. <laughs> okay, I think, Adam, you're referring to uh, 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 Yakubu's point that in, in, the, in the, what do you call the, uh, the compound house, the tipping actually is the beginning of, okay, anyway. Now let me let me respond to Yao's Yao's question about whether ethical conduct is European and whether we actually borrowed uh, from there. Now the some of the some of the practices sometimes, uh, and this is my view, I, I tend to think that there are some of these things that actually exist in our society, but perhaps uh, because of the documentation of the language. All right, and I'm sure when you go to Institute of African Studies, and you go and ask, you know, uh, the professors there. I'm sure some of them can actually tell you the local language for ethics. In fact, I haven't come across that. You know, those of you who know it, maybe you can tell us in class. All right. I, my suspicion is uh, some of these things actually exist with us, uh, but in a in a form that perhaps was completely different. And because of the dynamics of society, perhaps our relationship you know, with others, for example, from slave trade to, let's even start from the very early, in a, a very later years, like colonization, might have actually influenced our understanding and our attitude towards ethics and ethical conduct, all right? And that's my, my, my position. I think that there is something culturally about us that perhaps, permitted us are not from doing certain things. But because the relationship between our culture and our business was late, and therefore we only adopted Western textbooks on business and management, all right? There are certain things that culturally we could have actually embedded into our 
managerial practices and our business practices, but we didn't. And so we borrowed from Western concepts because the idea of management, you know, is Westernized. Although the idea of management has, you know, African perspectives as well, just as it has, you know, Asian perspectives, which they talk about total quality management, TQM, philosophy, etc. I am sure that we also have African management perspectives. But unfortunately, we didn't adapt the text, or maybe we didn't have the text to inculcate or to embed that into uh, the times when we started doing uh, formal businesses. And so we have left some of this. And so, yeah, the idea that ethics, you know, perhaps was borrowed from Western country, I probably would differ, but would have a, a perspective that perhaps, you know, we did not contextualize that into our managerial perspective. We probably had it, all right? But we didn't actually contextualize it into our managerial practice. And as a result, we ended up borrowing from Western countries. You know, the, the other side about whether, you know, uh, corruption were taught by, uh, uh, by Europeans to us, et cetera. To some extent, I would agree with you. Because and this, this afternoon, I was having a, a financial services marketing class. And I was telling them, how come that I don't eat pork, all right? <laughs> it's a it's a funny story, all right. And I'm sure some of you don't eat pork, not from any other perspective. But my not eating pork and my attitude towards pork, all right, and pork products, it's actually purely a cultural one, all right. It's purely a cultural one. Why? Because growing up, I'm the ninth born on my dad and my my mom's side, and the tenth born on my dad's side. And those of you who are actually you know, in tune with, you know, uh, what do you call, Akan cultures, especially those of us, you know, from, uh, what do you call, uh, from, um, uh, 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 oh, Inzuma, uh, what do you call, uh, the other side. Uh, you know, there's this tribe that are almost the same, Inzuma, Sefi, and then um, uh, uh, the other one, I've forgotten. Who are those? Ahanta. 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 Those of us from, from those areas, you know, there's a culture about, you know, Bedou and, and uh, what do you call, uh, Nkrumah, you know, that type of thing. And, and because of that, you know, growing up, I was, I was having these curries, all right? These curries uh, with uh, sheep and goats, you know, fair, and then there's some precious metals, or some precious stones that they put. And every, you know, Tuesday, my mom is supposed to do a tour and then egg and things like that for me. And then every year, my mom is supposed to kill sheep for my dad, <laughs> you know, for, for having that capacity to let her give birth to 10 people. And, and that culture abhors, you know, anything pork, all right? Now, here am I. I no longer practice, you know, these values, these cultural values, you know. But it has impacted on my consumption of pork and pork products, all right? So if you ask me, I don't eat pork. I've never ate pork before, unless I don't know. But if I know, my attitude towards pork is completely negative. And it has nothing to do with, you know, consumerism. Purely cultural, all right? And that is influence. To some extent, we had certain cultural beliefs about you know, taking things that does not belong to you. In fact, homes were open, people's homes could be open, and you can't enter, all right? Because there's a belief that if you enter, something wrong could happen to you. You know, in those days, there's no way you can sleep with somebody's wife or somebody's husband. You know the consequences, all right? Whether it happened or not, we, we believed it. Do you get it? And it became part of us. And the same way, we didn't actually collect monies that didn't belong to us, all right? We never went to see on, on Tuesdays in, in where I come from in Sekendita Kade. There is no way you can actually push your canoe on Tuesday. You wouldn't even there because the idea is that you will capsize and when you capsize, you will die, all right? The gods will not come to your aid. But now we're doing it. Do you get it? So as I was saying, there were so many social, cultural, values that bound us from being corrupt all right and we respected that and so the society wasn't corrupt 
But now these values, as we call them, the cleavages have disappeared. We no longer know our family, heads of families, you know, Ebusepen. How many of you know your Ebusepen? No, most of you don't know your Ebusepen. But those days, when you air, Ebusepen will come to your house at 2 a.m. and then knock and has, would have a conversation with you about you departing from family norms and family, you know, certain lines. And you would, you would actually respect that. Do you get it? So that's the bottom line, the reasons why I think I side with Yao that some way, somehow, we have actually metamorphosed in terms of our values because of westernization. The, the Western influences and the socialization that we've had with other people had made us leave some of these values, just like me. Uh, growing up, I stopped doing these calories, et cetera. My mom was worried, but I stopped it, all right? So my socialization with some people as well, et cetera, left me stopping all these things. And no, I don't feel that if I don't do those things, you know, I will be affected in any way. And so I stopped, all right? Anyway, do you understand the conversation? Yes, I do. Yeah. So- Doc, can I add something? Yeah, you can add. Okay. On the corruption issue, mm -hmm. we, we have gone into multi-party democracy. Yeah. And we have MPs at our parliamentary, parliament house. Mm -hmm. I remember when the MPP was leaving office in 2008, mm -hmm. the Kufo government tried to sort of privatize Ghana Telecom into Vodafone today. Yeah. This year for it appear, the mm -hmm. then MP mm -hmm. said all MPs were bribed with 5,000 US dollars. Mm -hmm and 10 matter. But in the Western world, particularly United States, mm -hmm. they have institutionalized or legalized corruption in their system mm -hmm. by way of having organization calls or oh, lobbyist groups. Yeah. That when businesses want their Congress to pass laws, the businesses go through this lobbyist group who will also then talk with the congressmen or house representatives. Mm -hmm. to pass the law in favor of the business mm -hmm. so that they will get their profit. Yeah. But we don't have it yet. But I know with time, it will come. Yeah, yeah. What do you say about that, Doc? No, it's true. I mean, the point is that I, I, I in particular, actually advocate for institutional, institutionalization of lobbying, just like we were discussing the other time. Why? Because I think that that would that would rather you know um, make us be clear as to the transparency of lobbying. The the PC of appeal for his point that he made, you know, was not transparent. Nobody knew until he blew the whistle. Do you get it? But the issue is that if we had to actually you know uh, uh, legitimize lobbying, then of course both the giver and the taker of the lobbying resources must actually declare it and must make it plain, must make it open to people. So yes, would that be legalizing corruption? Perhaps the debate is out there for us to have. But the reality of modern society is that these things are happening and these changes are actually occurring. And for me, I keep saying that at some point in time, we cannot pick and choose what is Ghanaian and what is global because we keep saying we want to develop. And if you want to develop, the model of development is straightforward, westernization, modernization. And some of these theories do not sit with our culture. So immediately, we have to open up the culture and we have to you know, break the culture into pieces and then we have to actually you know, uh, uh, move on. I, I have conversations, as I was telling you, some of the conversations that we're, we're having at the tourism level. We said, that, look, let us be frank. Sex tourism, must we discuss it? as a nation and then have a policy around it. Some people do not want to even hear it at all. But the point is that you want your tourism to grow as Gabon. You want your tourism to grow as somewhere else. If that is the case, then you must have a legislation on certain parts of the, of the, of the pie. You know, 
if you want to actually allow so-called messieurs and then so-called uh, gigolos, you know, within your system, where CEOs from the U.S., you know, CEOs, men and women from the U.S., would want to come and so-called relax in your country. You must be prepared for its, you know, uh, consequences. Recently, I don't know those of you who saw the story in, in uh, what do you call, is it Gabon or one of those? They said that they don't want to accept the tag of sex tourism, all right? But that's exactly what happens in, 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 in Gabon, all right? Young people make money through, you know, big CEOs coming from America and coming to while away time. And they call them, uh, they call the, the young boys, you know, uh, Gambia, yes, Gambia, actually, sorry, Gambia. They call, it, they call them bummers, all right? That is CEOs coming from America and then coming to have good time with young men and young women in, in Gambia, all right? Just like somebody says in Ghana, we we'll call it slave queen. <laughs> you know, so these conversations, you must have them and then know the way forward. But you see, we, we tend to be quiet and silent about some of these things, yet we know that it's going on. Do you get it? So it's a, it's a dicey situation. I mean, uh, as, as Yakubu was saying, we know corporate corruption. We know institutions actually give money to parliamentarians to lobby. We know governments actually give money to parliamentarians to push certain laws and certain things. It's happening. Now, what must we do? Must we legalize it or must we still keep quiet? That's the question that we are not bold enough to confront as a country, all right? Uh, we, must be, we must be ending, right? Linda, what time are we supposed to close? We're supposed to close at nine. We started at 6.30. Okay, so we still have some 15 minutes to go. Uh, are, we, are we enjoying the conversation? Are we on the right track? Very much so. Okay. Very much. Very much. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so I have two. We are, we are, we are stupendously enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know where that, I know where that language is coming from. <laughs> oh, no, you don't know. I know, I, I, know. You don't know. <laughs> I know where that, that terminology is coming from. <laughs> okay, so, uh, Abracadabra, you want to say something? <laughs> Your hand is up. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah, you didn't answer my question, no. Oh, yeah. What was the question? Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, don't worry. On the chat, on the chat, the Chinese connection. Oh, the I, Chinese I connection. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll break You ask the question while I check the, the Chinese connection question. Right. Okay, sir. So, so mine is not actually a question. It's more like a, an addition to the where we have the ethics. Yeah how we infuse it into our culture. So I would say some um, MNCs have actually infused what they have here in Ghana as a culture to what is actually preached or the westernized um, way of doing things. So um, in my firm, you would realize that you deal with a lot of people, like a lot of customers or suppliers. So at the end of the year, we do more of parcels of what we produce and then we deliver to them. So in as much as we, we have the modern, sorry, the modern actors mm -hmm. from the MNCs or the global team, we yeah. still have our local bits, which is infused in them, and then we still practice it. So yeah. I, I, I wouldn't say it's, it's that bad, okay. because okay. they know the geography or the regional they find themselves, and they believe culture plays an essential role in becoming a family. Yeah. Okay, so they do local, uh, localization. In a, yeah, we do glo we yeah. do globalization. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. great. Great point. Great point. Yeah. So you were asking about Chinese ethics uh, amidst their culture. Uh, in fact, if I say that I have a lot in more ideas on that one, I'm lying. Who has a an idea of how the Chinese handle ethics and 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 culture? Who has an idea that can actually respond to Yao? Sure. Now what? Yeah. Yeah, um, Pfizer here. Yeah, Pfizer. As far as my practice mm -hmm. or what I've experienced is concerned, mm -hmm. I will have to say, without any scientific basis, yeah. but my experience that the Chinese do not apply any ethics at all to their business. 
yeah. Yeah. At all, completely. I will give an example. There was one, there is one Chinese brand of mobile phone which is here in, in this country. Yeah. Now the year wanted to come in, they came in to one of the companies I worked in the past and we signed an agreement, it was an exclusive agreement mm -hmm. that we are going to handle their marketing of that particular phone yeah. in this country. Mm -hmm. Now we brought them in, we met ministers of state, we showed them around mm -hmm. our distribution channels here and there. Mm -hmm. Then just when they started becoming very comfortable, <laughs> they decided to set up here in this country. Then the man who we were dealing with first talking to others behind our backs. Wow. At that time, he has known the market, he knows circle, he knows bigger players in the area. Yeah. And then they were dealing with them. Wow. And now the brand is very popular in Ghana. And when we raise the issue, he says, look, he needs to business. Tell his business. It's the same way that the Chinese guys come to our country. Yeah. Find our own compatriots who are looking for money yeah. without any regard whatsoever for our environment. Yeah. They move straight into the bushes and live there for months, give them materials for them to use, machines for them to use to build our environment. So yeah. they can get our food and then ship back to their country and then they become rich. Yeah. You see a Chinese contractor working on the roads and just putting a sign to say, I'm constructing the road. So from tomorrow, this is the diversion. Use it and then don't use this other way. They just work as if, as if they, just don't, they don't have any regard whatsoever as far as my experience is concerned. Yeah. They have no regard for ethics at all. So you can see a Chinese government come into a country in Africa where the leaders have not been democratically elected and they tell you they apply the non-interference principle. Yeah. So yeah. when they come there and you are a cool maker who are seeking government, they say it is none of their business. They are in to have a, 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 a business relation. The government in place, whether they, they were cool or they, they don't care. Yeah. For me, yeah. from my experience, I think the Chinese do not apply any ethics yeah. as far as their yeah. business is concerned. Why they get what they want, that's all they care about. Excellent. Excellent. I, I think so too. I mean, in, in my view, I haven't been dealing with them, but I think ultimately most of it, that's what we see. All right, great. Yao, are you okay with that? I can't complain. Um, I, I, in fact, I just want to know how they handle it. So okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Nawaz. Excellent. Uh, Pfizer. Pfizer. Uh, thanks for your point. All right. Uh, Samuel, you have one we point. We have only nine minutes. minutes left. Yeah. We have nine minutes. So let's wrap up. Yes. Yeah. Samuel, you have a point. Okay. All right. Okay, I think oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so so um the the other point that uh, we have is about uh, sustainability. You know, the the philosophy of sustainability, you know, as a business and society thinking, and it says that sustainability development meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And here we are talking about you know, uh, sustainability from the perspective of environmental, economic, and then of, of course of the social. And has, uh, has business, has, business has, sustainability has become one of the, one of businesses most pressing mandates, you know, that we have to actually confront with. But if you look at the, the theory of sustainability and how business has actually applied it, you know, it looks like business has actually tilted toward one section of sustainability, all right? And uh, we have spent so much money on sustainability uh, in terms of we have environment, we have economic, we have social aspect of sustainability. Which part of the sustainability uh, discussions or policy do you think business 
had predominantly concentrated on? Do you have an idea? You can actually use your own business, your own organization. Which part of sustainability is your organization working with? Yeah? Economic. Economic. Faisal, can you, can you add a lot more to it for us? So like um, Yao has, 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 has argued earlier, which yeah. I, I largely support him. Yeah. Businesses are more concerned about the remaining in business. Mm -hmm. What it means is that whatever they have to do to stay in business is all they will do. If mm -hmm. um, it turns out that the environment is affected, they will attempt to be um, correcting their ways. Yeah. But eventually, they were always looking at the bottom line, profit, 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 profit. Mm -hmm. But I think that even if they choose to handle the environmental problems that they cause, mm -hmm. eventually it still leads to their own economic prosperity. Yeah. If they choose to tackle even a social issue, mm -hmm. for instance, unemployment, mm -hmm. for me, I think it still goes a long way Mm -hmm. to inure to their economic yeah. Um, sustainability. Yeah. Do, do you think that environmental sustainability is expensive and that's why business has shunned it? Or do you think that business actually, like uh, Donald Trump, don't believe in environmental sustainability? So can I comment on that? Yeah, you can. Yeah. I think businesses are not realizing the impact of environmental sustainability on their future existence yeah so they are gradually beginning to make a u-turn by this i want to use the auto industry mm -hmm. mercedes-benz the german automakers when the americans started doing ev cars electric car vehicles yeah they were just laughing at them Mm -hmm. And now tesla comes in breaks the market and now mercedes-benz and bw they all realize that people, the, the environment is changing. Let's do something. Yeah. So, so, so businesses have realized that there is just one ball, and that is all that they have. And if yeah. they really want to live for long, they need to start planning. But you can clearly see how they are doing it. Mm -hmm. They have allocated R&D budgets to them. They're coming up with wild concept cars, but they are still producing and mass their gas guzzling vehicles. Mm -hmm. Until such a time that society's needs will change to EV, mm -hmm. are just going to milk society as long as they can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, great point. And when they get to the point, the bridge where environmental sustainability is coming in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I think that th that's the that's the the source and the reasons you know uh, the source of the doubts or the, the the source of the doubters. You know when yourself and uh, Samuel were making the, uh, the case that, you know, at the heart of, you know, businesses respond to society is profitability. And you see that from the attitude of management, that economic sustainability, just like uh, yourself and Faisal actually said earlier, that since we started speaking about sustainability, majority of businesses actually plug their CSRs into economic sustainability. Why? Because that actually had a direct translation, they thought, to their survival and to their existence. So to some extent, it was give the money to society, but in the end, you end up benefiting from it. But they saw businesses actually saw environmental sustainability as a threat to their actual survival. Because environmental sustainability actually talks about the, the protection of the forest, afforestation projects, for example, the idea that we should stop felling trees, and then making sure that we can actually protect the forest. The idea that we should actually move towards uh, some kind of synthetics as opposed to the natural use of resources, et cetera. Some businesses thought that it actually meant existential threat to business. So you realize that most of the attitudes, the environmental sustainability wasn't on top of the business's agenda because they felt that it could actually spell doom for them. And some of them actually thought it was expensive. I mean, how much long must you wait for a whole forest that has been depleted to grow again? And how much resources must you commit? You know, these were critical questions, long-term questions that businesses who were so much short-term oriented, looking for profit, profit, didn't have time for that. 
and currently we are even talking about the rivers, our own rivers. We're talking about, you know, uh, what do you call Galamse and all those things. All these things coming to actually demonstrate that indeed, although business was opening up to the idea of society, they were looking for opportunities. Where are the low hanging fruits that we can actually plug and to demonstrate to the people that indeed we are responding to society, as opposed to taking on the big environmental issues, the big environmental you know, questions, and making sure that they can plug in resources in order to protect the society, to protect the environment. For the long term, businesses were serving these, these concerns, you see? So I think that, again, one of the questions that we must ask ourselves as businesses, where have we been concentrating on when it comes to business and society? When it comes to the idea of sustainability, have we been too much focused on economic sustainability? And to what extent is our shunning of environmental sustainability really impacting on our own business and our own survival? And how do we actually meet that challenge to, to, in order that society can have trust in us again that it indeed we actually care about the environment but not profitability? You know that what we call the triple bottom line? planet, people, and profitability. And organizations that actually respond to really sustainability, issue, sustainability issues, the planet comes first. And when we talk about planet, it is more of environmental sustainability. And then the people comes first, as the people come second, which is more of economic and social, you know, uh, uh, what do you call sustainability. And then before profit, that which, of course, is tied into economic sustainability and to our own survival. So I think that these are some of the questions that, as we leave here today, we have to ask ourselves, which part of sustainability has our business concentrated so much? Why are we concentrating so much on that aspect of sustainability? And what must we do to environmental sustainability, which is very pivotal? to the entire sustainability conversation. I think we must actually concern ourselves about that. Is that okay? Uh, anybody has any, a point to make before we finish on this note? Yeah? Anyone? Uh, okay, Daniel, you wanna say something? Yes, yeah. yes Doc, um, concerning environmental sustainability, I think mm -hmm. the responsibility is more uh, on the regulatory um, institutions and regulatory mm -hmm. bodies because the reality is the businesses will always focus on the economic sustainability mm -hmm. and if uh, we leave them to their own devices regarding environmental sustainability we won't get so much so I yeah. think so far the environmental um, institutions like the EPA have been doing mm -hmm. uh, their job of controlling what the businesses do in order to ensure that environmental sustainability is kept um, in focus and I think that's what um, they have to continue to be doing. And uh, that would solve the problem of environmental sustainability. Mm -hmm. We can't rely on the businesses to do it. Excellent, excellent. I, I like the idea of the EPA. Even, even the attitude of government towards environmental sustainability is appalling. Up to now, EPA, is EPA an authority? Or they, 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 they actually do not, it's an environmental protection agency, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah it, 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 has, it has been an agency since we knew it, all right, since it was set up. Why is it that EPA is not an authority that I can actually buy? And that actually tells you about our attitude, even as government, even as people towards the environment. Very, very, very minimal. And these are some of the things that we're talking about. If we look at, and I don't want to actually bring in any uh, present government or old government in you know, a concern, but I have to actually cite it. If you look at the 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 campaign that we did about uh, what do you call uh, um, uh, what do you call our rivers you know the the galamse look at the way the entire country rose you know to push galamse and government responded appropriately you know with much force and we all had hope that once government has responded with much force we are going to see the turnaround of our rivers what happened you know we're still struggling. And for some of us, we are so afraid that one day, one day, we will hear that there's a ship that's supposed to dock at Tema to give water to Ghana, and the ship is not here. And then we'll be we'll looking for water. And it's serious. <laughs> <laughs> 
And would it, would it be surprising to us? No, because things not that, that uh, tomatoes and rice that we used to produce in there is not supposed to come from Burkina Faso. So how was it that we'll be explained to you that a ship supposed to dock at Tema and then bring us water, the ship is still delaying. And then people are holding their buckets at Tema port. They are waiting for the ship to bring the water. We'll be here and then it will be happening. Romeo. <laughs> anyway, yes. Yes. <laughs> Whose hand is up? Okay. Uh, let's let Abina speak. Abina, let's listen to you and then we'll go. Wow. Um, <laughs> I would like to make a, a contribution in support of what I think Daniel said um, concerning um, the regulatory bodies. I, I work in the bank and then um, what uh, I've noticed even though um, decisions are sometimes taken mm -hmm. with regards to um, the environmental sustainability and social sustainability, it always boils down to economic. So the question that is asked is, how will this impact our PBT if we are to do this? Mm -hmm. If we are to go into um, a campaign concerning um, what's it called, global warming or something, how will this impact our PBT? So if um, the government will um, probably uh, compose you that, let's say, um, organizations are supposed to um, contribute a certain effort towards environmental or social sustainability i think will go a long way or else businesses will always look at how things will impact their pbt or or how they will um, make more profit okay out good of point. whatever that they do good point so what you're saying is that a, a environmental sustainability has to be a binding you know responsibility mandate all right and, and that's what people, just like what you have said, I mean, that's what people have advocated, that if EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, was actually made an authority, part of their feasibility study for businesses to, co to exist or to set up will be certain, you know, uh, uh, certain KPIs that you are supposed to achieve when it comes to environmental you know, sustainability. But because EPA is not an authority and it's just an agency they are not able to enforce some of these things all right so that's a fantastic point that you you have made if government would through policy you know enjoin companies to show certain key performance indicators regarding environmental sustainability things will change and i agree with you perfectly on that all right Fantastic point. So, so with the issue of the EPA, I think sometimes it depends on the nature of business that the company is carrying out. Because with the free zones, for instance, in applying for a free zones license, it's a requirement. You need to provide um, approval from the EPA yeah. to show that you've given approval to set up your site and you are going according to their policies and all that. Mm -hmm. but I think sometimes it depends on what the organization is doing and the kind of government agency that will intervene to regulate their activities okay all right good point Pfizer before I come to you let's let's listen to Nigel Nigel let's listen to you yes sir um just to buttress uh, the point Nawaz was making taking mm -hmm. a cue from what he said mm -hmm. I think um it's also the fact of the industry the organization is operating in mm -hmm. because uh for instance I'm in the oil and gas industry downstream yeah. sector yeah and um before you have the license from the National Petroleum Authority, mm -hmm. that's the MPA to construct and operate a storage terminal, mm -hmm. you have to have been passed by the EPA. Yeah. That all environmental um, T's and I's you know, are in place before yeah. you actually. So they are not entirely an authority on their own now, mm -hmm. but as an agency, I think it's a step by step process yeah. where they get to you know, the place where more yeah. emphasis is put on that okay so 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 essentially what you're saying is that it depends on the business and the impact that they have on the environment and that actually you know uh, describes the kind of intensity you know uh, they make on the demand or the in terms of intensity of demand they make on the businesses that's what you're saying all right Sir. okay all Thank right you. good point all right excellent 
Now, uh, abracadabra. Let's listen to you. Yes, sir. Hmm. So, um, I, w I think I, I side with what Nigel and um, hmm. Nawaz had mentioned. So, say if you look at, um, I think maybe Regis will be able to help me. He's on duties. So, if you are in a manufacturing company where you import stuff, and then when it comes to more like um, wrapper, there is a levy you pay to the government mm -hmm. for you importing wrapper. So companies which are also in this um, state, let's say the manufacturing state, mm -hmm. they are already doing their quota by paying a levy for bringing in wrapper because we know at the end of the day, it is going to go out there on the environment and so on. Mm -hmm. But I also want to applaud some company because in my company, mm -hmm. um, sustainability is more of a leadership goal. So it comes from the top to the down. And we just don't look at just economic, social, enhancing livelihood. Environmental is key here. And if you look at how we have partnered with certain companies in Ghana, where we, even the ink for us to use to print a material is environmentally friendly. Okay. You understand? So I think uh, people are less inclined with the knowledge of how we can do our best to bring out um, a more sustainable environment for the future. And I think that is where the challenge is. Yeah. Excellent. Now, uh, before I come to you, Faisal, let's listen to Linda. Linda, yes. Yeah, Linda. No, sir, it's okay. My point has already been made. Okay, excellent. Rejoice. It's let's right. listen to you. Oh, your hand was not up. Okay, Faisal, let's listen to you, and then I'll come to Gideon. Guys, we are wrapping up. So, mm. Yes, I, 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 I'm sorry, but I want to introduce this ideological debate in this whole okay. fight. Yeah, bring it on. Um, yeah. You know, hmm, those who are actually funding the environmental debates, yeah. those who are funding, who are bringing money, that, who are making noise from their countries, are the number one corporates as far as <laughs> destroying and depleting our environment are concerned. Okay. So we have a clear issue of the developed and the developing or underdeveloped countries. Mm -hmm. Now, the number one country in the whole world that is emitting the highest amount of carbon mm -hmm. to the environment is China. <laughs> yeah. After the last count, they produce 28%. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, they are followed by the United States of America. America, yeah. Who are producing 14%. Mm -hmm. Now, when you flip the coin, these are the two largest economies of the world. Mm -hmm. They are producing all the items we are wearing, we are eating, we are... In fact, this laptop I'm using, this <laughs> phone you are using. Yeah. And not my Kelly Willie. Not my Kelly Willie. My Kelly Willie is producing <laughs> Ghana. <laughs> the, the, the oil you use to produce your kelly willy. You know, you know. <laughs> so, say, it looks like this whole, so the, the school of thoughts that believe that this whole environment, let's protect the environment, is a sort of ploy, a ploy to get us from not manufacturing. Because if you're not manufacturing, you are not, you, you are not powerful, you don't have the means. And you're not emitting. I mean, you, you, you are not also emitting. Now, they are telling us they want to give us money for us to maintain our greenery. Why they yeah. continue producing and yeah. then control whatever goes on in the world? Say, so how do we address all this? Yeah, which, is, which is called uh, the, uh, the Ozone Lawyer Depletion Fund. Exactly. So, exactly. so uh, they, they give you money to tell you that keep your green and they will contribute to the fund every time you know that, that so India, for example, gets some money. You know, countries, some countries that actually sign up to it. I don't know whether we are getting some money and we are not seeing it. You know, so and then the carbon, the carbon footprint contribution. You know, some, some, sometimes some CEOs, some big corporations actually pay for the trust of their their CEOs. All right. So the number of trips that the CEOs make, you know, the CEOs make abroad, that is actually calculated into money to be paid into the ozone layer depletion fund or what we call the carbon uh, footprint, you know, uh, uh, fund in order that can erase their guilt 
on their contribution towards you know the environmental sustainability debate but you see the the the, the, the one of the one of the conversations that we're having during the COVID thing was that is this entire globalization agenda actually a flawed one because just like Faisal said almost everything that we get in this world is manufactured in China all right so how come that we're talking about globalization and then China seems to be the manufacturing hub of the world which means when China had issue with COVID and then they were struggling world production actually ceased and we saw huge fall of ozone layer depletion activities because China has actually reduced you know, manufacturing. And that's why Kofiana once said that if we don't distribute the benefits of globalization equally, and the benefits of globalization means that if we don't expand the, uh, the manufacturing base to include other countries such as the smaller African countries, where we can actually concentrate manufacturing there. The, the globalization, the benefits of globalization will not be equal. And so we'll have problems just as we're having now, like COVID hits, all right? Source countries that have been hit hard by COVID are the ones that we're supposed to expect some kind of you know, uh, manufacturing or some kind of service from. And now they're not producing, you know? So the idea that, you know, uh, uh, the, we are in a globalized world, seems to be a flawed one. The idea that, you know, because of environmental sustainability, some countries must produce and some countries must not produce, it actually seems to be a flawed one because some people have started questioning, you know, the idea behind why we must keep our greens. And then when you drive through the entire Britain, you realize that everywhere there's a production plant. Yet you are telling us that we should actually keep our forest and then we're still thinking about, you know, developing. So I think these are some of the conversations that we can actually concern, uh, con concern ourselves with and then start, you know, having some, 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 some solutions. But the point is that if we don't dialogue as just as Africa, we always do, we shun away the big conversations, the big ideological conversation, as Pfizer was calling it, that it's an ide ideological debate. And then we concentrate ourselves with the small, small ones, you know, the small, small issues. The daily, uh, people call it what, butter, a daily butter or butter, uh, daily bread issues. We will not- Bread and butter. Bread and butter issues. We will not go anywhere because we're not having some of the biggest conversations that we should have. I remember I was discussing, sorry for going overdrive, but these are some of the passions that some of classes like this actually, you know, bring. I remember I was actually discussing uh, some things with one of the Imani boys. They said in Ghana, we don't discuss this. I said, no, you're lying. Political parties discuss issues. What we don't discuss is we don't discuss policies because policies are long-term, they are very ideological, and a lot of people don't understand it. But we discuss issues. The issues are very short-term issues. Because if you come to my place and you say, you give me a uh, roads, I'll build roads. Road is not a policy issue. Road is, in fact, a program because everybody can do it, all right? But the big idea issues that demands how are you going to do it, which demands the ideological debate and whether we can actually demonstrate vision and demonstrate development, we're not having those conversations because those conversations don't win votes because people don't understand it. People don't comprehend it, all right? And it will take us so much energy in describing it. And because someone hasn't actually talked about or heard about building roads, they think that, nah, this guy, we can't vote for him. And that's why we're in this mess. I was going to use a very dirty word, you know. Uh, <laughs> Donald Trump also always keeps saying that we're in a shitty Africa. And somehow it's true, because we're not having the big conversation. <laughs> hey, Pfizer, you know. Yeah, we're not having the big conversations. We're not engaging the big conversations. And sometimes when we raise them, we bring about cultural issues, religious issues, this issue, this issue. Since, I mean, when are we going to confront the future? When are we going to confront the big, you know, uh, what do you call, ideological debates that can drive us? Sometimes you get frustrated by it. Anyway, guys, sorry.
Yeah, Bridget, you want to say something? My apologies, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah I've, I really enjoyed the class. Today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. My Bridget, Bridget, you are changed. one. <laughs> I've yeah. changed, and then I, I am really glad I didn't drop this course. Thank you. Yeah, but we've 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 gone overboard. I would suggest that um our next session, if we could start at six p.m. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sorry about that. I was having a financial services class, which was four to six. So it was difficult. Bridget, I like I like your strategy. You first of all, please, dog, and tell him that we should close. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good point. Yeah, thanks so much for that. Uh, last, last two, and then we can close. Who, um, yes, last two, last, last two, Gideon. Yeah. Four, five. Oh, I, I thought my hand were, was down. Um, I've been asked to lower my hand, so we close. But okay, okay, let me still ask good. my question. All right. But let me still ask my question. <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, mine is just um, a, a suggestion or more of a question. I was asking, yeah. I was suggesting if we could not um, be complementing each other, the regulator and then the, the business. Mm -hmm. Because you see, when you allow the regulate, when you allow the business to operate without regulations, they'll mm -hmm. go over, but they will destroy the environment. Yeah. When you um, go so hard on the business, they would complain. You know, now um, we've just spoken about ethics. Mm -hmm. You realize what happened with these uh, environmental issues, where the tax force is now being bribed to allow them to mine, mm -hmm. and so the regulator is trying to enforce the rules. People are bribing them, and so the ethics and then the regulation are all mixed up. So yeah. I think it's a situation where we both can complement each other, where the yeah. business would ensure that it's doing the right thing, and then the regulator is also ensuring that it's, yeah. it's um, um, enforcing the rules so that we okay. all coexist. Okay, let, let me let me add some point to the point you're making. It is true, but you know the reason why we are not having the fine line between the two is because there is an entrenched position. Look at the regulators. I, I may be wrong, but majority of times, those who head regulators are pure public service people. All right, they have very little inclination to business. Business people hardly also go into public service, and they hardly go into politics. All right, so you realize that the person who is actually heading the regulatory institution is a public servant, is a politician, and he has no attachment towards business. All right. So when, and I told you that when the policies are being made, they are made by human beings, all right? So sometimes you may think that, oh, they should see the good in what you're talking about. He's a human being. His affinity is towards a political party that actually brought him to the regulatory office. His affinity is towards public service. He has no inclination towards business, all right? Now, when we see a lot more business people driving some of this conversation as we're talking about, all right? Uh, 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 acclimatizing themselves with the big conversations of public and society, we probably can make the difference as you're talking about, because we may end up heading the regulatory unit and then coming from business background and coming from the public and uh, 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 societal background, we'll be able to appreciate how we're supposed to have a fine balance. I don't know whether I'm making sense. All right. Okay. Um, we're, we're closing. Nigel. Yeah, the last, and then we'll close. I think I didn't bring my hands down. Uh, okay, time. all right, so, so we are done. Linda, thank you for your class paying attention and then allowing me extra, thank you very much. extra 20 minutes to go over drive. For the stupendous, stupendous lecture, we enjoyed it. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Guys, enjoy your time, all right? And continue the conversation and the debate. Yeah, we'll again. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.